I'm Thais Harris, and today I am super excited to talk to Dr. Mandy Patterson, who is a functional naturopathic doctor specializing in fertility and natural support for hormones. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandy, for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And this is a conversation that's very near and dear to my heart. As many um, of you know, I'm currently pregnant and I'm 43 years old. So I'm what they call a geriatric pregnancy, which is such a horrible term, but okay. Um, and so I am really, really excited to talk about, you know, how do we support hormone balance naturally? How do we support fertility so that women can have children well into their 40s. And before we go into all of that, I would love, Dr. Mindy, for you to tell us your story because it is so inspiring and I feel like really gives such a, a backdrop to what you've been able to now accomplish and help people with in your life. Yeah, absolutely, Tai. So, um, you know, I actually started having children young. Um, didn't really plan that, but my husband and I got married young. We were high school sweethearts. Um, and actually, I initially was an occupational therapist um, before I became a naturopathic doctor. Um, so I was actually on my clinicals um, with my pregnant with my first son um, when things got really scary, actually. So he um, ended up being born three months premature. Um, I had developed severe preeclampsia or pregnancy induced hypertension for women here that might not know that term, but, um, and then I actually um, went into kidney and liver failure. So being 22 years old, um, pregnant with your first child and, you know, walking into an ER where they tell you, you know, you better get your things in order, um, you know, was quite shocking and um, just, yeah, kind of mind numbing actually. So um, I actually was put into a medically induced coma um, and he was taken by emergency cesarean. Um, he ended up weighing a pound and 14 ounces. Um, so he was, a, he was a very, very small preemie, um, which this was back in 2002. So, you know, I mean, this was 22 years ago. So um, he ended up having a really long extended stay in the NICU. He was in there for almost five months. Um, actually went through a lot of surgeries. Um, he ended up getting a condition called necrotizing intercolitis, um, which is where when babies are born so early, they have to feed them, but they also risk that these babies develop infections and other life-threatening things because their, their systems are, you know, immature. They're not fully developed. Um, so he, he went through, um, several surgeries that were, you know, he, um, almost passed several times. And so we, you know, we were very, very blessed that he was able to come through that um, and really saw God's hand in that um, in our family. But um, after he was kind of got through that, we were revisiting things with my health. And, you know, I remember sitting down and having an open conversation with my OBGYN and just, you know, asking, how does a really healthy or so I thought then 22 year old um, get so sick, right? I mean, that was the big question. And I wanted to know that just so I could optimize my health and I wanted more babies down the road. So um, what I did was, um, you know, she she told me at that point, well, let's do some testing. Um, and I said, okay. And so we did some testing for autoimmunity. Um, they tested me for lupus because women that actually do have um, lupus markers, genetic markers can go on to develop severe early preeclampsia. I was tested for antiphospholipid syndrome, which is essentially, I know that's a mouthful, right? Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically that is like where the, the man or the females, um, allergic to the, their partner's sperm. Um, so it's, it's an immunity thing, right? So mm -hmm. tested me for all those things It all came back normal. And at that point um, in my life, I was like, you know, I'm going to start digging in and doing my own research here because um, I was naturally a researcher um, myself and really just started to dig into literature and the science. Um, and even back then, there was there was a fair amount of information, which I know really in the last like, five to 10 years, there's just been an explosion with genetic testing um, and many companies that have popped up. 
Um, but back then I started learning that there were, I had some um, markers or SNPs that um, predisposed me to having early preeclampsia. And, you know, it had to do with blood coagulation blood coagulation um, and those kinds of um, markers that um, really had an impact. And so for all the listeners here, they would know this one probably now if they're in the health um, arena from a holistic standpoint, but um, I had MTHFR, um, the C67T um, marker, and I was homozygous. So we know with those um, unique situations that um, women are more prone to have um, hypertension in pregnancy, you know, they're more prone to have um, possibly early stroke um, and um, also um, frequent miscarriages. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was really interesting when I started diving in. Did it make you really afraid to then move on and say, maybe have other pregnancies or did you feel like it empowered you to then do things a little differently? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> I've always been that um, type of person that's kind of like that rebellious health person. Like, you know, I've always had a keen interest in optimizing health. And so like, really for me, it was more empowering than anything to say there's something I can do about this and that I'm not going to let um, medical professionals define my path in life, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. yeah, so I, I really, that, that was really empowering to me to realize that there were things that I can do. And what I started realizing when I reflected back on, um, you know, the pregnancy was I was in the middle of clinicals. I was finishing up school. We had just moved back from St. Louis because we live in Indiana. Um, and I had finished mm-hmm. my school work there and was just doing my clinicals, but I was kind of thrown into working 40 hour weeks, 40 to 50 hour weeks. and you know, and then on top of it, I think what it was, it was the perfect storm. I was exposed to, um, you know, some illness because I was around pediatrics at that point. I was doing early intervention and, you know, in the fast paced um, environment of healthcare, there's little time to use the restroom, to have a lunch, to go outside for even 15 minutes in the day to like enjoy the sunshine. And so I was, I realized that, you know, my body was really just like rebelling. Like it was, it wasn't an environment to continue a pregnancy in what I was asking it to do. Yes. And I've talked to quite a few practitioners who had premature babies during, you know, trying to work in a health environment, whether they were doctors, nurses, like, it's just, it's actually a very common thing. And it's so important to talk about it because pushing ourselves and being stressed is probably the number one factor that can really interfere with a healthy pregnancy. And so when you mentioned your genetics, it's like, yes, genetics play a very important role, but they're not a sentence, right? So it's what we're right. doing. It's why they're support or not support those, those tendencies that will make a big difference. So then so what happened? So your son made it through and yes. then you had all this realization about how things had gone. And then, yes. and then frankly, <laughs> um, I had been on um, back then, and this was before I really knew um, the challenges with birth control, but I had been on the breastfeeding pill, um, Micronor, <laughs> and I actually got pregnant with my second one, um, my daughter. So they're only 21 months apart. And of course, like, the, my doctor was like, they were, I think, scared for me, um, because like, that's just kind of the environment from a healthcare standpoint that they are trained in. Um, and so, you know, in that situation, I knew at that point, the things that I needed to do for myself to have a healthy pregnancy. And I worked really hard on that, but they actually put me on bed rest around 20 weeks. Um, it was modified bed rest and my body just wasn't moving. And so um, I did go full term with her to 37 weeks, um, but they took her about a week early because I was starting to go into higher blood blood pressure at that point. Um, mm-hmm. And they didn't want anything to happen like had happened before. Um, but I, frankly, what I think was, it's just, literally the lack of movement and not moving my body because 
after I had after I um, had her and then had her sister who's 26 months behind her um, because for all the listener, listeners I have six kids um, I hacked my genetics and I figured out how to get pregnant and stay pregnant and be healthy and have healthy babies um, but I with that pregnancy I worked out the entire pregnancy I was super active I was um, very particular about what I ate and what I put into my body. I knew supplementation, what my body needed. Um, and I went 39 weeks with her and I only gained 12 pounds without pregnancy. So, um, in that, the second pregnancy where I ended up on bed rest, I gained 37 pounds in my body. Um, we were talking about this before the show started. I I'm really small frame, like I'm, I'm five foot two. Um, and so like any extra weight for a smaller frame or, you know, there's not anywhere for it to go. Um, right. And so, yeah, so it really was interesting, like the experimentations I did on myself during these pregnancies. Um, and then my last three pregnancies, I knew exactly what I needed to do. Um, and, you know, my sixth one, I got into some complications because I was considered, I think I was 34 then. Actually, he just turned 11 yesterday. And um, they found a, an echogenic bowel for him. And so like I was um, monitored very closely with the perinatologist um, because a lot of times those babies um, are at risk for possibly Down syndrome um, mm -hmm. and some other challenges. But yeah, it was um, interesting, um, the things that I learned along the way and how it really helped. Wow. So thank you so much for sharing that so openly because it's a big journey. and. Um, and now you just mentioned you're actually presenting at the Intel X DNA conference in July, and you'd be presenting about your son. Is that right? That's correct. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, I've been working really closely with that company. Um, they are doing amazing work in the field of nutrigenomics and genetics. Um, and, um, you know, it's a decision support tool. So this is what I tell everyone that I um, teach about these things and even the client, very clients that I work with is, you know, the, the beautiful thing about it is this is just a, it's coming into being um, a much larger field. It's just in its infancy really at this point. Um, but what we're able to glean from that as far as optimizing um, people's health is, is quite astounding. And with IntelliX, they are looking at research and population groups and narrowing it down to those that have geni um, unique genetic SNPs that are like less than 20% of the population and seeing how those are influencing health. And then they actually um, provide information on nutraceuticals, lifestyle factors. And even in their case, um, they gear the test more with medical doctors. Um, so they also offer information around pharmaceuticals as well, which can yeah. be helpful because if if we need a surgery, um, you can actually look at the genome and figure out what is what medications are going to be best for you if you do actually require anesthesia, um, which is really, really cool, right? Yeah, that's so powerful. I use self-decode for, you know, as a holistic practitioner working with my clients with more of the approach of diet and lifestyle. So I yeah. don't get into, you know, the medication side of it, certainly, but the having a glimpse of like what best works for you down to the balance of carbs to protein to fat for each person yes. or the type of exercise that will most benefit them. Or, you know, there's a number of things that we can glean from that to, like you said, optimize what we're already doing. Yeah. Not using those, um, those SNPs, which are the single nucleotide polymorphisms, they're just the variants. They don't need to mean that we're going to have a condition or a disease. It just means that because they're there, we can switch a few things around in our life to make sure that maybe that little switch stays turned off. Absolutely. Right? And, I and I really do think the investment in knowing your genetics and nutrigenomics um, is kind of like, it's, it's somewhat of a life insurance policy, only like you know, we're paying for it right out of pocket. And so even though, you know, the tests can be a little bit more expensive. I mean, if you look at like, you know, if you don't work on these things earlier on in your life, um, the health challenges that may come up down the road that may be even more costly than that. So, yes. 
So true. And so I would love to go back to some of the practices that you did. Once you found out that you had, you know, the MTHFR and some of the other genetic markers, like what were some of the practices that you did? And that now, as you look back after, you know, 20 years of not only doing that for yourself, but now helping many, many other women do that. Are, is there a thread? Do you find that it's always very different or is there a thread of things that it's like, they're going to help every woman's sort of fertility and ability to carry? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. And so, you know, I tell um, my audience and, you know, my clients, like, you know, the, I think you would agree with me on this, like that the top three biggest deterrents to health, I feel like currently are the standard American diet or crap foods, um, stress and toxins. And we really, really live in this toxic soup. And, you know, we see that um, with the explosion of infertility that we're seeing anymore um, in the field, you know, younger and younger couples that are struggling to get pregnant. And, you know, we have to pause and ask the question, well, why is that, right? Um, and, you know, just even going back to vaccinations, we've tripled the vaccination schedule since the 80s. Um, that's, I feel like, a piece of the puzzle. Um, another thing is, it's just the amount of toxins in our environment, what we're breathing in, what we're eating and drinking and consuming. Um, and so, you know, I think as a practitioner, and, and I know you use different tools in your practice from a testing standpoint, but we can look at the toxic load of the body through different testing. You know, it can be basic labs or it can be hair tissue mineral analysis, which I use in my practice. It could be organic acids, you know, um, and then there's other tests out there as well. But um, we can actually look at that and see the impact that it's having on the body. And, you know, we do know this, that toxins, um, and nutrients kind of go hand in hand. And the higher the toxic load, usually we see the higher depletion in minerals and vitamins and our body just needing and requiring higher amounts of antioxidants and phytonutrients. So when we know that information, we can do something about that and we can personalize things, which I feel like should be the future of medicine versus this cookie cutter approach where someone goes in and they have, say, high blood pressure, and it's just immediately suggested that they're put on a beta blocker. Um, right. We know for a large portion of people that's not going to work because we're not addressing the underlying foundations that need to be in place for us to have, you know, good blood pressure readings. So I think whenever we use that along with the tools of genetics and nutrigenomics, we can take it to another level, right? And so mm -hmm. When you talk about diet, so things that I did, so I started learning about myself. I don't metabolize fat very well. Um, I am that type of person that needs a higher protein diet. Um, mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say necessarily lower on carbs, but um, I strategically use my carbs throughout the day. So, um, and, you know, I think for everyone it's different, but what has worked well for me is on the front half of my, my morning, um, front loading my protein, um, getting in lots of um, phytonutrients through plants, um, you know, really working on my omegas. Um, and so getting chia seeds and flax seeds in my smoothie um, or in my, my bowl, whatever that looks like, adding in lots of um, nutrients through like spices and herbs. Mm -hmm. um, and so like as an herbalist, I'm really passionate about the power of plants um, and how that can really impact our metabolic health. So those that was initially like dietary, some changes that I made. Um, and then also like I really and I was I was always an athlete growing up. Um, you know, I grew up, I played softball, soccer and volleyball. Um, and I realized for myself, like how important movement is for from a medicine side of things for me. Um, yeah. and even if that's a walk, um, walk outside or, you know, sometimes I do high intensity air, interval training. Sometimes I do yoga. I always mix it up. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's been really important as well. Along yeah. with stress management strategies, really implementing, making time throughout my day for downtime. And I'll be honest as a busy entrepreneur and a mom, it's 
really challenging to do that. But anymore, like having my lunch is a non-negotiable. I'll go sit outside in the sun. Mm -hmm. or, you know, my kids are home this summer. So we'll do something outside, go out and, you know, just sit and eat together. Yeah. So. I'm so glad you mentioned that because especially the lunch non-negotiable. And I know working with clients so often, that's the meal of the day that gets overlooked or that it's had in the car at a meeting at a thing. And I had one client that had kind of an aha moment. She um, worked in a financial institution. So very high powered, high stress um, scenario. And she had this male boss who was French. And one day, like, because I kept insisting, like, take, can you take 10 minutes of your day to go somewhere and have your lunch and don't have an area to ask? <clears throat> and at the beginning, she's like, I, I just can't see how that would happen. And so finally, she books this meeting and somehow his calendar was clear at lunch. And she books a meeting around lunchtime. And he comes to her and he says, my schedule is always blocked off. My lunch is non-negotiable. Like I, I take an hour for lunch. Do not book any meetings at that time. Yeah. Like, you know better, you know. And that was the moment that she went, wow, here I am. Like I, she was just working through it and thinking she was so needed during that time. And, and maybe she was really needed. I don't want to take away the fact that, yes, she, she did work in an environment where her attention was needed, but that it, all we have to do is make the decision that no, I'm going, even if it's 15 minutes, Yes, but it's just that notion of having a separate environment or a separate situation where your body can actually go into rest and digest and not yeah. just be stuck in fight or flight do 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 because no. there's no energy going to digestion when we're in that place right no and then like sleep is so important for me the older I get the more I realize I'm like I need to be in bed by 10 and then I wake up when I wake up and I really don't even need an alarm because our my body wakes me up and that's really what it should be and unfortunately, we're the society where we all have these alarm clocks, our phones by our beds to wake us up. And if that is waking us up, then there's a problem, right? Like yeah. we're not getting enough sleep. Yeah. And especially, I mean, I do appreciate that now there are certain apps that at least help wake up Yeah, at the end of a sleep cycle, which can be so different from waking up in the, in the starting of one when you just wake up and you're totally exhausted. Right. But uh, the key, which is like figuring out what is the latest I could go or should go to bed so that I actually naturally wake up at the time I need to wake up. Because well, we're I think forcing the midnight, bit, like, yeah, we're not going to be ready at six naturally, right? But I think that's so important for women that are trying to preserve their fertility, that want to have babies in later years, say 30, like 30s, 40s. Even like, I think I just saw where Cameron Diaz just had a baby and she's 51, right? I mean, the thing is, is our fertility does not fall off of a cliff. It's the inputs that we're putting into our body that really impact that. And we can accelerate our aging or we can age backwards. And I love the thought process of that because we all want to age gracefully. And I think everyone here wants to do that. Yeah. Um, and while we're doing that, we can preserve fertility. So when we talk about that sleep wake cycle, um, in the morning, when we get up, we want our cortisol up coming up higher, right? Because that's what's getting us up out of bed. Um, and you know, that's our, our master hormone. Um, and then all of our downstream hormones come off of that. So like if our cortisol rhythm is off with even melatonin, then we're going to have issues with our hormones. And so um, the way I like to look at it um, is, you know, we have to go upstream if we've got hormone issues or, you know, again, we're looking at preserving our hormones. Like we've got to go upstream and look at all those other factors and mm -hmm. get those optimized. So then like our body will naturally find balance and rhythm. Right. And you brought in stress, which again is such a big part of living well, period. Right. But then add in hormone balancing, yes, to dealing with stress because of all that happens in our bodies and the types of hormones that we are building and releasing when we're constantly under stress and how it doesn't leave a lot of building blocks for the juicy hormones. Right carrying your pregnancy. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about 
like nervous system regulation and some of what, what are some of the stress reduction techniques and practices that you use and that you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that there is, I have such a large toolbox for that, um, you know, being trained not only as a yoga um, instructor, um, but then also like I've done Eastern training with um, um, EFT. So that's emotion, emotional freedom release technique. Um, and then, you know, simply something that is, I feel like so devalued or we don't talk enough about is breath and like in breathing. Um, <laughs> right? Take a deep breath into their bellies right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just and and here's the thing, like as a society, you know, th we've seen the shift in women, like and how there's so many more demands on women, like that we we have careers and then we have babies, but then we're also taking care of aging parents and grandparents. Um, sure. And frankly, like the demands are too much for the average person. And so that's even with the busy professionals that I see um, in health. Um, you know, there's just so much dysregulation with their nervous system because, you know, they're constantly being pushed and constantly being driven to produce. And so a little bit more perspective here and just how I really came to see this as such an important piece in the foundations was um, my husband and I moved our six children abroad and we lived in Australia um, for two years for his job. And I had never lived outside of the United States. I had visited, but I really didn't know how other people lived. And I, it was such an immersion into a culture um, in Australia where they prioritize their self-care. Like it is the top of their list in much like Europeans, um, you know, in the French um, in the British, like they really do prioritize that downtime throughout their day. And so one thing that really just resonated with me is that the Australians have their morning tea. And even in the schools, um, the kids have their morning tea around 9.30 or 10 a.m. So that means they get to sit and rest. They get a brain break, which I love. And then you get a little snack. So, um, you know, that was really interesting for me to see that. And then, like, another piece of it was is that every 8 to 10 weeks, actually probably eight, every 10 to 12 weeks, they would get like a holiday. So their um, school system was broken up into um, quarters, really. Um, and But they still got a, a, somewhat of a summer break at the end, which is like actually in December and January, which is funny right. for us all. But they're in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So same with you guys. Um, and um, so, you know, they like for one or two weeks, the kids would get off and the families would prioritize going on holiday. So like we got to go up to Northern Australia, take our kids up to Cairns and the Great Barrier Reef. We went to New Zealand and got to experience North and South Island. Um, you know, we went to Italy and experienced what Italy was like. Um, and just that education or that immersion into the world to see how other people live. Like when you come back to the United States, it's quite shocking. And you're like, oh my gosh, there's like so many things that I had no idea the way our culture has trained us, you know, and so um, back to those tools of the things that I actually really love. And it's just simple practices because as a busy mom, I'm driving the car around all the time after my kids, like two of my boys go to school. It's like almost 30 minutes away from our house. So simply just doing those deep breaths while you're in the car, um, you know, just focusing on that breath work because, you know, our, the, our overall health is intimately tied into that breath and we want more of an oxygenated environment. Um, mm -hmm. and that's like how our cells thrive. Um, and so breath works one, like the, um, tapping, I think tapping is such a valuable tool and it's something so simple, um, to incorporate into the day. Um, you know, just simple going, no, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say people can get tapping if you look up EFT tapping and just Google that. It's probably going to come with um, your first searches are going to show you a map of where to tap. You can see videos of people tapping. I actually released an episode where um, 
I'm doing tapping with a practitioner and we're actually yeah. working on something like real time so people can do it with us and all of these beautiful points um, that are coming from acupressure and there's there's just the whole science behind it but yeah. um, if you're interested it can take five minutes and it's a wonderful tool so EFT tapping and then look back on the channel for my tapping episode. Thank you. Uh, and then, well, and then even teaching our kids to, to do this because really like it can make a really big difference for them as well. Um, Cause I have two kiddos that have struggled with more attention deficit issues and really helping them with focus and attention. You know, that's something that can be easily done even at school for them. So, um, you know, honestly too, I just love nature. Like I'm a gardener. Like I love to be out in the sunshine. I mean, just putting our bare feet in the grass, you know, is just so powerful. So, um, I think building it, it I think the practice of self-care is like building a muscle. Like we build muscles in the gym, you know, it's just a matter of the more that we commit to it and the more that we do it, it just becomes a part of our routine and, you know, can yeah. really change those brain pathways to rewire us and the way we see things and handle stressors. Cause we, cause it's more about building, I think, stress resilience. Um, my partner, Dr. Jeannie Shockley and I teach couples on that all of the time in our, um, our positivity fertility coaching program. Um, we teach them on that through tapping and breath work and meditation or prayer, you know, whatever resonates for someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I think too, sometimes, yes, it's great to have a break in the middle of the day. I think the constant reminder is awesome, but if people are going through their day and they're so busy, they forget about it. Don't worry. Like when you lay down to go to sleep before you go to sleep, it's worth it to just have yeah. that moment or before you get out of bed, which, which is actually how I built for myself a practice. Yeah. At first I thought I had to go and sit for at least 40 minutes and a half. And then the days I didn't do it, I would kind of then beat myself up that I didn't do it right. You know, all that. And then I realized that if before I even got out of bed, if I, for me, it helps having hand on chest, hand on belly, because it's part of helping me feel my breath inside out and outside in. Yeah. But having a practice where you're really getting in tune with what's happening inside, right? And, and yeah. sometimes it helps to then finish with a visualization or gratitude. There's so many things that then just can completely change your day. And whether you do that before you wake up or before you go to bed, it starts building that muscle in a very small, very doable way. I agree. And I, I love gratitude journaling, you know, like... And like all of my private clients, we really work on that and just reframing things, right? Because when we focus on lack or thereof, then that's the space that we're going to live from. And that's the way our nervous system is going to be wired. But if we really focus on that, all the abundance, right? We all have abundance in our life um, and writing that down. And it just, you know, makes a really big difference in the way we approach things in life in challenges and circumstances like we all have things that we have to deal with you know life can be hard like that but um the mindset in which we approach it can make a really big difference and you know it can make a really big difference for us that are um working on hormones or working on that fertility journey um and, and frankly i feel like it's the very first thing that needs to be um, you know looked at and optimized before we can do anything else because we have to be in a state of um, flow and, um, you know, peacefulness to, to do all those things that other things that we need to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. It makes it all much easier. If we start with all of the other to-dos, we can actually increase stress sometimes, right? And increase anxiety about all the things we have to do. So if we can bring the nervous system well, you know, a few notches down. Um, I also, I love chiropractic care and acupuncture yeah. for that reason. And I'm getting yep. support from those right now. And you said something really important, which is your perspective and where you're living from, because we know what we focus on grows. And so if we're focusing our energy um, on all the things that could go wrong, you know, that tends to be what we're drawing or going toward. And when we can do so, even with combining the breath work with the visualization, is actually seeing ourselves with that baby, with the pregnancy, you know, and even for me right now, 
again, because of my age, you know, and there's so there's a lot of conversations about all the risks, but that's, I understand that that's a thing I need to be aware of. It's not where I want to live. I'm actually right. seeing myself with this baby and my family and all the beauty that is, you know, included in that. And that that's such an important part, I think, of staying low stress during pregnancy, because yes. it could be that all those medical conversations could really can really increase stress in a way that then won't be helpful for the pregnancy to begin with, right? Well, and that's my message to women is even when they're younger, like you are your um, captain of your ship, like when it comes to your health. And if you have a practitioner that's not supporting you in that way and allowing you to ask questions and advocate for yourself, then maybe it's time to find a different practitioner because, you know, we should all be empowered and feel um, peacefulness about like the journey forward. And I love that you said that you you have a midwife um, that's supporting you on your um, pregnancy journey. And it's so important to have some partners in your life or friends or mentors that you trust that, you know, you can bounce ideas off of and, and just um, come to a place of recognizing that there's so many things that we can do uh, mm -hmm. that, that we have the power to change and, you know, knowing that and owning that is big. Yeah. And it's the people that can hold the vision that you have with you, yeah. you know, whether you know, vision of healing, a vision of growing, a vision of, you know, having a baby, like that's so important. And so, yes, I know that you do that for your clients. So how can people find you? And I will do a quick recap because I do think you said so many amazing and important things, but this notion of aging backwards is that we can we we don't necessarily need to bear biological age. Not that I'm I love the fact that I'm aging. It's it's a privilege, right? Right. That my life hasn't ended, and that, but that there's so much we can do because it's not just about our biological age. It's what we're doing in our day in day out that really counts toward how our bodies, our cells, are aging or not. And so, going backwards with the diet, and you mentioned having all your nutrients, you know, really preloading in the morning with your protein and then your antioxidants and your fibers, your omegas, um, the breath work and stress reduction, the sleep. What else am I leaving out? Yeah, no, I think those are like our, you know, and even, you know, here's the thing I can just add to this for women that are really like wanting to optimize their, their fertility and their hormone health is, is knowing your cycle, having an awareness around that it is our fifth vital sign. And so like yeah. being tuned in to, um, the flow of that cycle and like how, how we feel at different times of the month, um, can really make a really big difference, um, in kind of hacking things and, and figuring out what our body needs, which we could do a whole nother podcast on, foods that you would eat at different times in the cycle and, and such. But um, I think just that's another thing too, that is so helpful for right. women. Because we actually need carbs when yes. we're building estrogen and, or yeah, and progesterone. So there's, there's different times in the cycle. Like we're not the same creature. Nobody is actually men included. We're not the same right. day to day. But especially women with their cycles, there's a difference and there's different amount of rest that we may need, different amount of carbs and things like that. So right. thank you for that recap. So what, what, how can people find you and how can they work with you? Yeah, so I, they can find me on my website, which is mannypatterson.com. If they go there, we have um, a free fertility and success guide um, that they can download. They just um, have to share their email. Um, and then also my partner, Dr. Jeannie Shuffley and I, um, we work together with couples that are working on their fertility and that are maybe even struggling with infertility. Um, we do group coaching and we have a full course and program. It's a three month long program um, where we provide support. And that is at www.positivityfertility.com. And I am out on Instagram at Dr. Mandy Patterson on Facebook, Mandy Patterson, functional medicine practitioner. Um, so those and are your podcasts, right? Your show. Yes. 
my podcast. I'm also on the Gutsy Fertility podcast where we talk about all things women's health and fertility and hormones. Um, we have lots of inter interesting conversations, which you were on that, which was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes. So I will put some links uh, in the show notes, but I hope people can connect with you. And I thank you so much for your time. 